This is Barb Polson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development at Utah Valley University. In it, we're looking at the first of two online quizzes for Chapter 10, Life's Final Chapter. The first question in this quiz is, the term dying is best described as what? And remember, you get four choices, pick one of them. The irreversible cessation of vital life functions, the end stage of life in which bodily processes decline, leading to death, starting with the confirmed diagnosis of terminal illness or irreversible decline in organ function, or the point at which, excuse me, the point at which consciousness cannot be regained. Well, you know, truthfully, I have to admit, if it were me, I would have picked A, but we're in a developmental psychology class, and so the one that's going to get you credit is D, dying. And no, not death, but dying is the end stage of life in which bodily processes decline, leading to death. Of course, that assumes you having uh, death over a certain amount of time, not like you got hit by a truck and you're suddenly dead. That's a different thing. All right, question number two. What do medical authorities generally use as the basis for determining that a person has died? Because interestingly, there is some gray area in this. And the choices are brain death stoppage of the heart, both brain death and stoppage of the heart, either brain death or stoppage of the heart. Well, the interesting thing about it is you can basically keep a person's heart beating forever with enough machinery. And so the uh, general criterion is not the heart, but is the brain death. And so that's when you no longer have any organized um, electrical you know, brain activity. It's just, uh, it's just not working. And um, that one you can't fix so well. And so that is generally regarded as being dead. Now, the next question, um, we're going to follow through. After receiving an urgent call from his father about an automobile accident involving his mother, Peter races to the hospital. He learns from the hospital staff that his, mother's, his mother is brain dead. The emergency room physician explains to Peter that his mother what? A, has a 50% chance of making a full recovery depending on the success of upcoming surgeries and physical therapy. B, requires a respirator because there was selective damage to her brainstem. C, suffered irreversible damage to her cerebral cortex and will not regain consciousness. Or D, can hear his voice and knows that Peter and his father are with her. Well, as optimistic as many of these might seem, if you're brain dead, you're not going to recover and the choice is C suffered irreversible damage to her cerebral cortex and will not regain consciousness. Now, there are a lot of kinds of brain damage that are not the same thing as brain dead. And so talking about a specific thing here in particular, and I believe the next question follows up on that one. So we start with the same thing here. After receiving an urgent call from his father about an automobile accident involving his mother, Peter races to the hospital again. He learns from the hospital staff that his mother is brain dead, like last time. Peter wants confirmation from the emergency room doctors who show Peter the results of what? Her EEG recording, her MRI scan, her CT scan, or her PET scan. Okay, it helps if you know that EEG stands for electroencephalograph, that MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging, that CT scans for computerized tomography, and that PET scan stands for positron emission tomography. Um... The one that you're going to use for brain scan, I mean, basically, it's not even a scan to, to tell if the brain's alive, is actually the simplest of these. It's an EEG. That's just looking for electrical activity on the brain. If there isn't any there, then your brain dead. All right, question number five. What is a critique of Kubler-Ross's five stages of dying? Well, there's going to be a lot of critiques. Uh, they are based on the clinical stages of dying. They ignore the emotional needs of those who are terminally ill. They are most relevant to, for those suffering from a terminal illness. They do not adequately address situations pertaining to terminal illness. Fine. Well, uh, a critique that has been voiced is that, you know, they're most relevant for people suffering from a terminal illness. Again, they don't apply to getting hit by a bus. You don't have time to go through the stage. Or if you have a very quick illness, um, you don't really go through the whole thing. The Kubler-Ross stages really apply to somebody who's basically told they have cancer, they got six months or a year, and, you know, there you go. Then and that triggers the whole thing. Other situations, it's not going to apply quite so well. Number six, following cardiac arrest, Bob's 86-year-old wife, Cynthia, remains comatose and shows no brain activity. Bob feels strongly that Cynthia would not want to remain in a lifeless body. 
He searches the internet to find out what type of drug overdose will cause her to slip into a quiet, peaceful death. What type of euthanasia is Bob contemplating? Remember, euthanasia, good death, or a sort of a mercy killing. And um, she's comatose, and he is talking about giving her a drug overdose. Is that involuntary active euthanasia, forcible active euthanasia, submissive euthanasia, or passive euthanasia? Well, only two of these are common terms. Um, forcible active euthanasia is not a, uh, we don't talk about forcible, we talk about uh, involuntary, submissive, you know, we talk about passive. So the choices are A or D. Now, she's out of it. She is not making the decision. Bob is making the decision, and he is going to do something that would cause her to die. So that is involuntary active euthanasia. Again, involuntary because Cynthia is not making the decision. Bob is. And um, active because he has to do something, uh, giving her a drug overdose that will cause her to die. The next question looks very similar. It starts with the same stem. Following cardiac arrest, Bob's 86-year-old wife, Cynthia, remains comatose and shows no sign of brain activity. Bob feels strongly that Cynthia would not want to remain in a lifeless body. That much is the same as the last question. This is where it differs. So he discusses with her doctors the possibility of removing her from life support. What type of euthanasia is Bob contemplating? Now, in the last one, he was talking about a drug overdose. This one, he's talking about taking her off life support. So, are we talking about involuntary active euthanasia, forcible active euthanasia, submissive euthanasia, or passive euthanasia? Well, you know what? Like the last one, B and C aren't actual choices. Those are made-up terms. So, we're talking about is it involuntary active euthanasia or passive? The last one was active because he had to do something. He actually had to add something. He added drugs to make her die. This one, he would be removing something. And he, so, he would stop keeping her alive. And that is an example of what's called passive euthanasia. So that's what Bob's talking about in this case. Question number eight. A document prepared when a person is well, directing medical care providers to terminate life-sustaining treatment in the event that the person becomes incapacitated and unable to speak is referred to as what? A living will, a resuscitation rejection order, a medical proclamation document, or a personal health plan? Well, there's actually a lot of uh, different terms, and the one that you actually find most common legally is what's called an advanced directive, um, anyhow, or advanced care directive. But the term we're looking for here is living will. And this is one in which you specify who can make decisions for you. That's actually a power of attorney is what that's called, but also specifying what you want to have happen. And uh, I'll tell you right now, if you're 18, you're not too young to do this. Um, you can do them for free. Uh, there's a site called Five Wishes. It sets up a very kind of touchy-feely one. It's nice. It's good to look at. It is not uh, legally binding in Utah. You're just going to want to type in um, Advanced Directive in Utah, and you'll get the state form that is uh, legally binding, and I strongly suggest you do that soon. Um, again, never too early. Question number nine. When do the Chinese believe that the spirits of the dead visit Earth from the underworld? Well, your choices are Easter, a Christian holiday, the Chinese New Year, at least that's Chinese, Ghost Month, or the Day of the Dead. Well, the Day of the Dead's a Mexican holiday. Um, so it's going to be B or C. Uh, in this case, the correct answer is, come on, spirits of the dead from the underworld, that's going to be Ghost Month. And... Um, so that is a form of celebration. I like that it's an entire month as opposed to a single day, like we have with Memorial Day or the Day of the Dead. And uh, our last one here with names I cannot pronounce. What were Masajewski and colleagues' assessment of Jacob's stages of grief? So this is a we're talking about a theory developed by uh, Selby Jacobs and some other people's assessment of that. So what the critics said that yearning never went away but persisted in varying degrees for a lifetime or acceptance of the death of a loved one occurred prior to depression or yearning, anger, and depression rose suddenly in the predicted order and disbelief was highest just after the death of a loved one and quickly waned within months. Well, uh, for once in the world, it turns out that a stage theory was supported. Jacob said that yearning, anger, and depression occurred in that particular order and the uh, researchers found that they confirmed, yes, they occur rapidly in that predicted order. And that is the last question. 
in the first online quiz for uh, chapter 10, life's final chapter in psychology 1100 lifespan development. Thanks for watching.